Today, we're going to look at three medical mysteries, with each story being more unbelievable than the last. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, and you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time you're visiting the like button at their house, be sure you rub poison ivy all over their toilet paper. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. On June 14th, 2011, 42-year-old Ellie Lobel stepped unsteadily outside of her house in Wildemar, California, and immediately she had to lean on her round-the-clock caretaker for support. This mother of three had just moved to this rural part of California so she could die in peace. For the last 15 years, Ellie had been battling Lyme disease, which is a chronic and debilitating condition spread by ticks. But now, after those 15 years of fighting, Ellie just had no more energy. She could barely stand up on her own, her mind was kind of always in this weird fog, and she just felt totally hopeless. And so Ellie had recently hired an end-of-life coordinator to help her plan for her death, and also to make sure nobody attempted to revive or resuscitate Ellie if she fell unconscious. Ellie really thought she was gonna die any moment and just wanted it to happen in peace, in California, in her bed. But dying can be complicated, and Ellie, after moving to California, had laid in her bed for three days expecting to die, but didn't. And so, on June 14th, Ellie decided she would just get up, and with the help of her caretaker, she would just go for a walk in her new town. Every step was painful for Ellie as she clutched her caretaker's arm, but the sun was out, the sky was blue, and flowers were in bloom all around her, and just for a moment, Ellie suddenly realized she was feeling something she had not felt in a long time. She was feeling grateful to be alive. But that feeling was very short-lived because as she stood on this sunny sidewalk in California, she suddenly felt something small and sharp smack into her forehead. And Ellie, she kind of looked up and realized it was a bee. Now, she was determined not to let an insect ruin this rare instance of happiness in her life. Ellie just kind of reached up and tried to swat it away. But when she looked up again, she noticed the bee was still there, and worse, there was now an entire cloud, a swarm of bees over her head that were descending down on her. And as this happened, Ellie's caretaker, who saw the swarm, screamed, let go of Ellie, and ran away from her. And so poor old Ellie, who couldn't even stand up on her own, was forced to fall to the ground and kind of cover her head with her hands to try to protect herself. But within seconds, these bees had descended on her and and were stinging her head, her ears, her face. I mean, she was getting destroyed. And these were not normal bees. These were African killer bees that were known for stinging their victim dozens of times. And Ellie was fiercely allergic to bee stings. And so instead of dying a peaceful death in her bed, Ellie was now going to die a viciously painful, awful public death out on the sidewalk all by herself. Ellie's life had started out with so much promise. By the time she was just 18 years old, she had already earned her PhD in physics. And then by 1996, when she was 27 years old, Ellie and her husband had three beautiful children and they had moved into their dream home in New York's Westchester County. Her life really seemed perfect. But that same year they moved into their dream home, Ellie suddenly noticed there was this rash at the top of her thigh, and it kind of looked like a red bullseye, and Ellie had chalked it up to, you know, some sort of weird spider bite and not thought much of it, not realizing that that bullseye marking is actually the calling card for ticks who carry Lyme disease. That's what they leave behind after they bite you. But Ellie didn't know that, and so not long after seeing this rash, Ellie began having night sweats and night shakes. She had these flu-like symptoms that didn't go away for months, and it left her totally exhausted and discouraged. Doctors told her that she could have arthritis, or fibromyalgia, or MS, or heart failure, or some other horrible condition, but it was ultimately a park ranger that Ellie just happened to meet one day who recognized that that rash she described at the top of her leg was very likely because she had been bit by a tick that had Lyme disease, and now all of these symptoms, that seemed like Lyme disease too, and then when Ellie went into the doctor and said, I think I have Lyme disease, they said, yep, you do, but now the disease has progressed so 
so far, it's basically too late for you. And so for years, Ellie wasn't able to work or really even be a mother because of this disease. And then eventually her marriage fell apart and ended in bitter divorce. And so this disease really had just kind of wrecked Ellie's life. And so at the 15 year mark of having this disease, she decided, you know what, enough is enough. I'm going to California and I'm gonna die on my own terms. But Ellie had envisioned a peaceful death in her bed, not an agonizing death caused by a barrage of African killer bee stings out on a sidewalk in some random town in California. The attack on Ellie lasted maybe about a minute, but it was the longest minute of Ellie's life. The pain was just unimaginable. And then after all the bees had left, Ellie's caretaker actually came running back over to her, scooped her up and began running with her back to the car. And as Ellie was getting carried, Ellie realized her caretaker was probably going to take her to the hospital and she didn't want that. You know, even though she had had that kind of nice moment before the bee stings when she was looking around at this beautiful town and the sun was out and the flowers were out, that wasn't enough to inspire her to want to live. She still, deep down, did just want to die. And so she figured, you know, with these bee stings, I'm gonna have an allergic reaction any minute now, and that's gonna take me out, and I just want it to happen so I can be done. And so Ellie made her caretaker drive her back to the house and put her in bed, and then Ellie laid there waiting to die. But three days later, and Ellie had not died yet. In fact, she actually felt the best she had felt in years. There had been no discernible allergic reaction to all of these bee stings all over her head, and all the chronic pain and discomfort that she normally felt all the time from Lyme disease was gone. And after doing some research about bee stings and about Lyme disease, Ellie came across this 1997 study done in Australia that found the active ingredient in some wasp and bee stings was powerful enough to kill the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. But no one had ever really researched this because it was totally unethical to release a swarm of bees on a critical Lyme disease patient. But in Ellie's case, this happened on its own and it really did cure her. The bee stings literally saved her life. And since her bee attack, Ellie has become the leading advocate for bee venom as a treatment for Lyme disease. I am so excited to announce that we here at Ballin Studios have a brand new show that is live right now for free on all podcast platforms. It's called Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, and as you might have guessed, it's about medical mysteries. Take, for example, the very first episode of the show called Ashes to Ashes. It's about this adult son who goes to check on his father who lives in the woods by himself. And when he gets to his dad's house, he goes inside and the power's off. And there's this weird gooey substance on everything, the furniture, the walls, food everywhere. And the son, he calls out for his dad. He can't see his dad. His dad doesn't call back. And so the son leaves and gets help. And when help arrives, they search his father's house and they find something in the very back of the house that is far more bizarre and shocking than the gooey substance on the walls. Their discovery would quickly become one of the most talked about medical mysteries of all time. Again, this story is called Ashes to Ashes. It's episode number one on Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, which is a podcast that is new and free and available everywhere. New episodes of Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries will come out every Tuesday, but if you have no patience and you just want to listen to a whole bunch of episodes right now, now, you can listen to eight episodes of Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries on Amazon Music. Again, the show is called Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, and it's available right now everywhere for free. In the late afternoon of May 1st, 2016, 13-year-old Shoaib Ahmed and his nine-year-old brother, Abdul Rashid, chased a soccer ball across a dusty plain near their little rural town in Pakistan. Abdul, who was very athletic and quick on his feet, managed to kick the ball past the defender and then kicked a line drive shot right at the net, but at the last second, the goalie jumped and blocked the shot. And so Abdul threw his hands up in exasperation, but even though he was frustrated, he missed a shot. He was having a blast. He loved playing soccer with his brother and the neighborhood kids. 
But as much fun as he was having, Abdul at some point looked up and he noticed the sun was starting to set behind the mountains. And immediately when he saw that, the expression on his face went completely deadpan. And then he looked over at his brother, Shoaib, who also had noticed the sun was setting. And by this point, Shoaib was already rushing over to Abdul. He grabbed Abdul's hand and the two brothers, without a word to their friends, who were just kind of standing there watching, they took off and just hustled back towards their home. The brothers made it to their home, but on the porch, Shoaib, the older brother, just collapsed onto the ground with his arms and legs going totally stiff and his jaw locking up to the point where he couldn't even speak. And Abdul, instead of trying to help his brother, just stepped clear over him and ran into the house and made it to his bed just in time for him to also collapse, but onto the bed with his arms and legs being just as stiff as his brother's and his jaw also being locked so he couldn't even speak. And then moments later, the boy's father would scoop Shoaib off the porch, carry him into the bedroom and put him in a bed, cover him up. And then the father would rotate Abdul who was on his stomach over onto his back and he put the covers over him. And then the father just left and got into his own bed and went to sleep. And this was a typical night in this family's household. The next day, a convoy of fancy cars descended on this little village where Shoaib and Abdul lived. And in these vehicles were all these scientists from Pakistan's Institute of Medical Sciences. And they had heard about the boys' nightly bizarre collapses and they wanted to find out if the condition was real. Now, if the scientists had arrived in the village before sunrise, they would have found Abdul and Shoaib still in their beds in a semi-comatose state, unable to move. But it was almost noon by the time the scientists arrived. And so when they saw the two boys, they were outside goofing around and playing, acting like everything was totally fine. In the village, neighbors referred to Abdul and Shoaib as the solar boys because they were only normal and active and like the other kids during the daylight hours when the sun was up. And then at night, they would become totally paralyzed and mute. Now, the villagers saw this happening, but they didn't really believe it necessarily. They thought maybe the kids were making it up to get attention, or maybe they were doing it as like a grift to get people to donate money to the family. But Shoaib and Abdul's father completely denied this and said they had not made any money from what was happening to his sons, and all they wanted to do was just figure out what was wrong with them so they could help them. The scientists would talk to Abdul and Shoaib's father first, and he would explain to them that really since Abdul and Shoaib were very little, they had been suffering from these nightly paralysis events. And so with the family's permission, these scientists got to work. They collected blood and urine samples, not just from Shoaib and Abdul, but from the entire family. And then also the scientists tested Abdul and Shoaib's balance and coordination, you know, obviously during the daytime and the boys both did completely fine. And then as sunset approached, the scientists just stood there and watched as Abdul and Shoaib slowly lost control of their bodies and became paralyzed and mute. And then throughout the night, the scientists just continued to watch them and the boys did not move at all. And then when the scientists attempted to kind of move their limbs for them, they were so rigid, almost like rigor mortis after you die, that they really couldn't move their limbs at all. And then the next morning, as the scientists were watching, the sun came up and it was like suddenly Abdul and Shoaib were totally back to normal. They popped out of bed with a smile on their face, able to move around, no problem. And so to the scientists who watched this go on, they were left thinking, okay, there's no way these kids could be faking this. Like no one could fake this, this is real. But the scientists really didn't have any new information to pass to the family because, you know, the boys' blood and urine samples came back completely normal and they had passed all of their balance and coordination tests. And so it seemed like, you know, Abdul and Shoaib should be totally normal, healthy boys, but they just weren't. And these scientists didn't know why. Now, these scientists were not the first group of people who had tried to solve the mystery of the solar kids. For years, their father had been trying to find someone who could help them, but he was having no success. Doctors in the nearest hospital to their village were convinced that the boys had a rare illness that made them extremely tired only a couple of hours after waking up in the morning. But Abdul and Shoaib had loads of energy all day long. It was only when the sun came down that they became totally paralyzed. And so the father didn't believe those doctors were really taking this that seriously. 
the imam at a local mosque was convinced the boys were possessed by demons, and so he organized an exorcism where a group of religious leaders basically tapped on the boys with sticks while chanting in rhythm and dousing them with holy water, but that didn't work. And so the family was close to giving up on ever finding help for their sons, but then in April of 2016, so a month before that team of scientists descended on the village to research the boys, a TV news reporter from Pakistan's version of CNN came to the village to interview the family because this reporter had heard about the strange condition these boys had. And this interview was seen by millions and millions of people, including Pakistan's most esteemed and influential doctor, a man named Dr. Javed Akram, who happened to be the vice chair Chancellor of Pakistan's Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. Akram had never heard of such a strange condition, and so he was the one who ordered those team of scientists to go to the village and research this family. And after those scientists came back and checked in with Dr. Akram, it was clear they had not had a sort of breakthrough moment with regards to what was going on with these boys, but they were very convinced that this was a real condition. And so Dr. Akram decided that he and his team would just continue to study this family until they figured out what the heck was going on with these two boys. And finally, a year later in May of 2017, Dr. Akram believed he had figured out what was wrong with them and he even had a solution. But his solution was so simple that Dr. Akram actually kind of second guessed himself thinking, you know, this is too good to be true. So the doctor decided he would run one more experiment just to test his theory and make sure he really was correct. And so Dr. Akram flew Abdul, Shoaib, and their father out to his institute in Islamabad. And that night, Dr. Akram watched as the two boys slowly slipped into paralysis as the sun went down. But this time, as soon as the paralysis was clearly beginning, Dr. Akram gave each of the boys a pill. And 40 minutes would go by, and suddenly, Abdul, who was totally mute and laying there still, broke into a smile, and then he raised his right leg. And then Shoaib, right next to him, he too smiled and turned his head. And then 20 minutes after that, both boys were up on their feet, totally fine, laughing and joking, because they had never really done anything at night. They were always paralyzed as soon as it started to get dark. It would turn out Dr. Akram and his team had discovered a very strange mutation in Abdul and Shoaib. Our brains naturally produce all sorts of chemicals that keep them running, and one of those chemicals is called dopamine. Dopamine does several things, but one of those things is it controls muscle movement. The mutation that Dr. Akram and his team had discovered was that the boys' genes were mistakenly shutting off dopamine production every single night, and so that was why they were becoming totally paralyzed. This mutation was the result of a series of complex genetic mistakes, but the fix was actually quite simple. The pill that Dr. Akram gave Abdul and Shoaib was just a dopamine pill, and what it did is it basically just turned the boys' bodies back on. And so Dr. Akram and his team had discovered quite possibly the world's rarest disease only afflicting one family. But fortunately, they had also found the cure too. And so Abdul and Shoaib from that day forward lived totally normal lives by taking their dopamine pills every night. On the evening of July 3rd, 1992, 35-year-old George Decker was cooking in the kitchen inside of the apartment that he shared with his girlfriend in Jasper, Indiana. And as George cooked, he began to cough. At first, George thought it was just a little tickle in his throat that would go away, but as he continued to cough, this feeling, this sensation in his throat that was making him cough was only getting worse and worse. And this cough was not a normal cough. It was a deep, guttural, kind of rough sounding cough that really hurt as he did it. And it kind of scared George, like he had never heard himself make this sound before. And in the other room, George's girlfriend, Juanita, she heard this very odd sounding cough. And so she came out into the kitchen to see what was going on. And when she got there, she found George leaning on the counter, barely able to catch his breath because he was coughing so much. And this was totally out of character for George. 
He wasn't sick. He didn't have some sort of respiratory problem. He didn't smoke cigarettes. He did work in a metal shop where he melted down aluminum and poured it into different molds, but he always followed all the safety precautions. He wore a mask. You know, he did all the things you're supposed to do to make sure he didn't inhale anything toxic. And so there was really no good reason why George would suddenly be having this unbelievable coughing fit. And so as Juanita kept asking George, you know, hey, are you okay? Can I do anything? George, he can't even talk. He just pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket and he put it over his mouth as he continued to cough. And then when he pulled the handkerchief away, it was clearly covered in blood. Now, George was quick to kind of put the handkerchief back in his pocket, not wanting to deal with the fact that he was coughing up blood. But Juanita, she saw the blood and said, okay, George, I don't know what's going on, but you are going to the hospital right now. Now, George, even though he couldn't talk because he was coughing so much, clearly did not want to go. And he kind of resisted Juanita pretty aggressively. He did not want to go. But Juanita finally grabbed him and literally dragged him through the house, out the front door and down into their car. And then just a few moments later, they were on their way to the hospital located a few miles away. By the time they actually parked in front of the emergency room at this hospital, George's cough had actually died down a little bit. And so now George was being really insistent that it was totally pointless to go to the hospital, that they did not need to be here. You know, take me back home. This is ridiculous. But Juanita really pressed him and said, you can't goof around with coughing up blood. You have to go in there. And so finally, George, who was totally annoyed by this, relented. He got out of the car and the two of them walked to the hospital. And then when they went in the front doors of this emergency room, a nurse came up to greet them and see what was going on. And George kind of inexplicably pushed the nurse like to get away from me, I don't need your help. And Juanita, she was so embarrassed and tried to apologize. And the staff just kind of rolled with it and just kind of gave him his space. And then for the rest of the time they were there, the staff basically only talked to Juanita while George sat in the corner with his arms crossed, unwilling to talk or give them any information. Toward the end of this hospital visit, the doctor would prescribe George some antibiotics for what he called an upper respiratory infection. And then the doctor asked George if he was willing to stay the night so they could observe him and make sure he really was okay. But George flatly refused. He got up, turned around and practically ran out of the hospital. And Juanita said, I'm so sorry. And she followed after him. Over the next couple of days, George would take these antibiotics that he was prescribed, but they really did not make a difference. He continued to have these huge coughing fits, and even worse than that, something Juanita noticed was George's skin was clearly turning blue, in particular on his arms, his hands, his fingertips, and on his face. And so finally, about a week after that first visit to the ER, Juanita, she looked at George and just felt like he looks so bad. He has to go back. They have to check him again. And so Juanita was able to, again, convince George to go to the hospital. He was very resistant to the idea, but now he was so physically weakened and drained from whatever was going on, he just kind of went with whatever Juanita wanted. And this time, when they went to the hospital, they would give George a chest x-ray and it would reveal George had pneumonia pneumonia in both of his lungs. This explained why he was coughing so much, and it also explained why his skin was turning blue. Because of this infection in his lungs, his body was not getting enough oxygen, and when that happens, it leads to a condition known as cyanosis, which turns your skin blue. But when doctors tried to figure out what was actually causing George's pneumonia, they immediately ran into a brick wall. Usually, pneumonia is caused by bacteria, viruses, or some other microscopic invader, and doctors can test a patient's mucus to determine which one it is. But when they tested George's mucus, they couldn't find any evidence of anything that would cause pneumonia. The doctors also ruled out aluminum pollution because he did work in a metal plant and could have been inhaling the aluminum when he melted it down, but he was negative for that. And then also doctors began looking into all these crazy other possibilities like strange fungus that maybe George had come in contact with that caused this or, you know, very rare viruses and bacteria. But no matter what the doctors thought of, when they tested George, it would come back negative. 
And so, with the exception of his x-ray that clearly showed he had pneumonia, every other test they ran on George made it seem like he was a healthy guy. And so George would spend weeks in the hospital with doctors and nurses constantly trying to figure out what was wrong with him, but not succeeding. And as each day went by, George's condition got worse and worse until finally he was put on a ventilator because his lungs actually just didn't work on their own. And so a ventilator basically forces air into the patient's body. But no matter how much oxygen they pumped into George's body, he continued to have these terrible coughing fits and his skin stayed blue. Finally, in October, so three months after George had first developed this coughing fit, he would pass away. George's doctors were totally baffled. It did not make sense what had happened to George. He was young and healthy, and then something that was totally powerful and aggressive had wiped him out. And so the doctors knew they needed to figure out what that thing was and how to cure it before other people died from the same mystery illness. On October 8th, so five days after George passed away, an Indiana pathologist named Dr. Daniel C. Weaver, who was known for his ability to figure out unexplained deaths like George's, was called to the hospital where George died to perform George's autopsy. And when Dr. Weaver began the autopsy and looked inside of George, he could not believe how just absolutely ruined George's lungs were. Healthy lungs are sort of like cotton candy. The tissue is light and airy, which is perfect for transferring the oxygen we breathe throughout our bodies. But George's lungs were thick and heavy, and they were lumpy with scar tissue. I mean, they were totally useless. And so Dr. Weaver knew, you know, George basically suffocated to death. But now the question was, why? Dr. Weaver would run into the same obstacles as all the other doctors when he attempted to find contamination inside of George's lungs. There was nothing to see. In fact, at the end of the autopsy, Dr. Weaver had basically learned nothing as to why this happened to George. In frustration, after this autopsy was over, Dr. Weaver went to George's medical records and just began reading through them, and it was at this point that he saw something very odd that other doctors clearly had seen too, but they must have thought it was not important. At that very first ER visit, Juanita had told nurses and doctors that George, before he had begun coughing in the kitchen, he had been in a great mood. And generally speaking, George was just a very positive and upbeat person. But she said once he started coughing, it was like he transformed into somebody else and became mean and nasty. And Juanita had to practically drag him to the hospital. And then also there was a note in the file about how George had walked through the doors and pushed that admissions nurse. And so Dr. Weber thought to himself, you know, maybe George's belligerence was not just him being a jerk, but maybe he had ingested something toxic that was affecting obviously his lungs and also his brain, and that was causing him to behave this way. And so Dr. Weaver called the manager of the metal shop where George had worked to try to ask him if there were other chemicals or toxins inside of the plant that maybe George had been exposed to. But the manager just did not want to talk about any of that. Instead, he just wanted to talk about basically how awful George was as a person. The manager clearly did not like George, and he began talking about how George was obsessed with making money at all costs, and that in addition to working in the metal plant, George had all these kind of sketchy, kind of borderline illegal side jobs to make more money. And then at some point, the manager just began talking about this one particular potential scam that George was involved in that had to do with little bits of silver and gold and the doctor at this point is not really even listening. He just wants to get off the phone with this guy because it's obvious the manager is not really trying to help. He's just trying to bash George. But at some point, the manager, in detailing this gold and silver scam, mentioned something that piqued the doctor's interest. And suddenly the doctor was really intently listening to this manager and actually began taking notes and asking clarifying questions about this particular scam that George was apparently involved in. And then when Dr. Weaver hung up the phone with this manager, he felt pretty confident that he had actually figured out what had happened to George. The clues had all been there the whole time. George's blue skin and his rude and violent behavior at the ER, but nobody had put them together correctly because the cause of what was happening to George was so weird, no one would have ever thought of it on their own. On the night that George first began coughing in the kitchen, he was not cooking dinner like everybody assumed. He was actually cooking teeth. 
like human teeth. The metal shop manager told Dr. Weaver on the phone about the scam that George was involved in that had to do with little bits of gold and silver. And the manager explained to Dr. Weaver that George was going to all of these local dentist offices and he was collecting all of their discarded teeth. What George wanted was teeth that had fillings in them because some of the fillings, especially for older patients, were made from gold and silver. George would then literally cook the teeth until he was able to extract the gold and silver. Now, if he had just been cooking teeth with gold fillings, he'd probably still be alive. But because George also was cooking the teeth with silver in them, during that process of cooking the silver teeth, mercury gas was released and George would inhale the gas. And mercury gas is deadly. And so the gas went into George, it ravaged his lungs, and it also created these massive mood swings and mental disturbances, which explained why he became so nasty and mean when he got to the ER. Also, ingesting high levels of silver, which George was doing as well, can turn your skin blue. So in the end, George did not die from pneumonia. He died from mercury poisoning. So that's gonna do it. If you enjoyed today's medical mystery stories, be sure to tune in to our brand new podcast called Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries that is available wherever you get your podcasts right now. Again, it's called Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries.